evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to Disrupting the Resilience Narrative event. Tonight's panel is a part of the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series here at the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. And my name is David Goodman. I'm an Associate Dean here at the school and also the Director of the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Programming. Our hope is that tonight's talk and talks actually are meaningful and provide a calling to a deeper sensibility to this incredibly important topic at hand. It's an honor to be hosting Dr. Jernigan Noesi once again. She's now a uh, frequent guest in the series, and she brings with us tonight, uh, she brings with herself tonight, two colleagues who she'll introduce and who will help us tackle this incredibly important issue. Before I hand it off to Miriam, I just want to add a little something, and that is that as I see it, uh, at least in my field of, of psychology, it often feels as though we're, we're caught up in, in fads. Uh, whole movements tend to explode onto the scene and most of them are taken with a type of fervor because they are reacting to something very real and attempting to give a balm or solution that corrects the course of our society or the field and how it's seen things. In my perspective, resilience narratives often fall into this category, an attempted fix that galvanizes tremendous energy, but that doesn't sit long enough with itself and some of the deeper ideas, traditions, and questions that might allow it to interrogate itself about the implications of how such a narrative will play out in a culture and society such as ours. I believe tonight will allow us such an interrogation, and I'm very grateful for my colleagues for their wisdom and guidance as we seek better understanding and more just systems. So with that, I'll hand it off to Miriam. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you all this evening um, in an effort to really engage in a discussion. Um, I think myself as well as my panelists are really hoping that we will stimulate some thoughts, some ideas, but most importantly, good discussion that allows us to plant seeds, um, as David indicated, that'll that'll really facilitate our ability to expand um, our curiosity, to continue to engage in critical discourse, uh, especially for us around the topic of racial justice and thinking about resistance and resilience and the narratives that have been created and are currently being used as we uh, think about and certainly work towards racial equity and racial justice. Um, I am Dr. Miriam jernigan Owesi. By training, I am a licensed psychologist. Um, I am an advocate um, of racial equity. Um, uh, as a psychologist, I was certainly trained um, uh, as a child psychologist, you know, working with children and with families. And my own passion uh, for the field of psychology was really ignited in my own childhood. Um, and it was really based on my reflection, even as a young um, child at that particular time, not having the language, again, and background uh, and knowledge about the field of psychology, but certainly the, the questions that I think arose for me as the child of um, a veteran and sort of watching and hearing conversations around mental health are really kind of how are we thinking about outcomes, right, the mental health and well-being of individuals and the types of situations that impact them, and really wanting to have, for me, a desire and an impact to really think about my ability uh, as a health service provider um, and as an advocate to really think proactively uh, about the ways in which we are thinking about and engaging in the work of ensuring, right, that all individuals um, have the ability to, to really live um, lives um, that embody a sense of well-being. Um, so I was, just by way of background and relative to tonight's panel, introduced to the concept of resilience pretty early on, I would say, in my training as a mental health provider, um, especially given my interest in thinking about children and development and families and context. Um, and, and to be honest, right, I think um, I certainly understood and continue to understand the notion of resilience um, and the desire to better comprehend how or what is um, what is it that's connected to our ability or the ability of some individuals, in some cases, groups or communities to face adversities um, and to use some of the language, I would say, in terms of folks that have defined resilience, the sort of idea of how folks bounce back from such exper experiences. But it was also in those definitions where I found myself questioning um, and really um, refuting, right? Some of the language, some of the conceptualization of resilience as it was being introduced to me, certainly as a trainee um, and as a psychologist in training. 
in essence, the concept of resilience as it was presented and is often discussed today was uh, often felt in many ways inadequate and misguided, especially as it pertained to the lives of children's individual, children, excuse me, individuals, families, and communities that I was working with, that I desired to work with, uh, who overwhelmingly identify as folks of color. So I was not, I would say back then, initially confident in my ability to articulate what it was that didn't quite fit or didn't quite sit well or align with my professional experiences as a mental health professional in training or even as a person of color. But over time, that lack of confidence waned. Um, here I am, right? And the pers my perspectives continued and continue to shift. Um, absolutely, right? Those shifts were have been fueled by my experiences and the narratives of those folks um, who have been racially minoritized, marginalized, excluded, and oppressed in particular. So tonight, I feel as though I am having yet another full circle moment, my first being um, one of the, the evening lectures that I was invited to participate in by, by David a couple of years ago, um, based on a, another topic related, um, but certainly very near and dear to my heart with regard to racism-related stress and trauma. But it was well over a decade ago that I actually wrote in my dissertation, right, the culminating project of my graduate degree, um, an entire section regarded to the notion of resistance and resilience. And so as I was preparing for the panel tonight, I went back to that dissertation. I reread the table of contents and was faced with um, seeing right in the table of contents an entire section entitled from resilience to resistance and so here we are um, as I reread that section many of my thoughts from back then remain I want to note that for myself and for my panelists tonight we are very much aware and want to honor the fact that we are not the originators right necessarily of the sentiments that we will suggest and offer there have been scholars and liberatory activists and individuals who have championed the importance of a resistance framework for decades. And it is with that sentiment that we invite you all into our discussion, which I am hoping uh, will certainly be conversational in style, um, allow you all to react, formulate questions that we will save time and space for, but really unpack right uh, this topic of disrupting the resilience narrative um, at, which we will do amongst ourselves across disciplines, across professions, across experiences, and which we will do with you. So to that end, I will introduce uh, my panelists, which I am honored um, to both know and to work with, to have worked with and continue to build partnerships to work with. The first being Dr. Hector Adamas. Dr. Adamas received his doctorate in clinical psychology from the APA accredited program at Wright State University in Ohio um, and completed his APA pre-doctoral internship at the Boston University School of Medicine Center for Multicultural Training and Psychology and we share that experience. By training he is a neuropsychologist and currently a full professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology he co-founded and co-directs the Immigration, Critical Race, and Cultural Equity Lab, um, or the IC Race Lab. Dr. Adamas is one of the most prolific psychologists, I say this to, to him all of the time, but one of the most prolific psychologists, dedicated psychologists, and has published several books, including, um, you know, uh, in addition to, I should say, multiple chapters, as well as manuscripts. But those books include Cultural Foundations and Interventions in Latinx Mental Health, History Theory and Within Group Differences, published by Rutledge Press, Caring for Latinx, um, Latinxes with Dementia in a Globalized World, published by Springer, and Ethics in Psychotherapy and Counseling, a Practical Guide, published by Wiley. More recently, uh, Dr. Adamas has published um, Succeeding as a Therapist, which was literally published last week by the American Psychological Association, and in May, believe it or not, <laughs> his fifth uh, book, Speaking the Unspoken, which I am uh, very much so awaiting, will be published also by the American Psychological Association. Um, Dr. Adamas' research focuses on how social race and skin color and colorism and ethnic and racial group membership influence um, wellness, and he has earned, as a result of uh, his prolific work uh, and research, several awards, including the 2018 Distinguished Emerging Professional Research Award from the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, 
Ethnicity and Race, a division of the American Psychological Association. And in 2021, he was honored with a presidential citation from the American Psychological Association for his commitment to human rights and racial justice through his research service and membership. So welcome to Dr. Adamas. And I appreciate again, you're joining me this evening for this panel. We also welcome Dr. Mary Kelly Pearson, um, who is a lawyer and former teacher who focuses on children's rights, civil rights, and education law. Dr. Pearson earned a PhD in English literature and taught college and high school before returning to law school in search of a way to serve the public. After joining the board of the youth, of the Center, excuse me, for Youth Wellness in 2015, Dr. Pearson began years of study of the literature and research on child trauma, focusing especially on social determinants of health and trauma factors that impact racially marginalized children and children made vulnerable by poverty, LGBTQ status, language, difference, and other factors. As a pro bono counsel to the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, she has represented the organization as amicus curiae. You can tell me if I said that wrong. <laughs> um, in a number of cases involving child trauma, most notably the Supreme Court case of Regents of the University of California versus the Department of Homeland Security. And in that case, ABSAC led a coalition of 36 child advocacy organizations and individuals in a brief focusing on the present and future harm faced by children of DACA recipients who face a very uncertain future. In June of 2020, the Supreme Court found that the attempted recession of DACA was illegal and restored the program's protections. So Dr. Pearson is the former VP of Legal and Strategic Advocacy at the New Teachers Center and the current VP, I believe, of Legal Strategy. You can correct me if I didn't get your full title correctly for the Boys and Girls Club of San Francisco. So again, it is my honor. I met Dr. Pearson, um, I think through our shared passion with regard to thinking of the thinking about the rights of, of children and in particular um, thinking about sort of the topic of race related stress and trauma um, and how it is that we really can think about right sort of action and resistance relative to these really important topics. So thank you both for being here um, with me this evening for engaging in conversations prior to tonight and also in the conversation that we will undertake today. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we planned this particular format instead of a you know a static presentation whereby there are you know sort of visuals and us talking right at you. Uh, we hope for more of a discussion so that you all can also um, both bear witness to, um, but you know begin to I think sort of hear discourse that allows us I think to sort of navigate the different ways in which we come to the topic and the conversation based on our respective identities, right, backgrounds, positionalities, as well as our professional and personal interests. I'm a person who certainly values discourse. And so rather than presenting, um, I think it was our goal to use a series of prompts to really illuminate valuable information that we feel is worth sharing and considering. And so tonight's webinar will ideally leave you and us, right, with more questions and, and the ability to really continue to stretch our thinking and our actions. So we welcome, as was indicated in the chat already, uh, any commentary that you have. Um, there are folks that will help us monitor the chat. If you have questions, we encourage you to drop those questions into the Q&A function. We have saved and reserved, and I will certainly keep track of time um, in an effort to ensure that we have space tonight to um, engage with your questions as well as your commentary. But it is certainly our collective hope that we all leave here. Um, continuing to engage in thinking and discourse, and most importantly for me, and I think for my, my panelists, action that allows us to continue the necessary work to strive for racial equity and for racial justice and to disrupt right, systems of oppression. As a way of opening our discussion, I'm actually hoping that we'll start out, you know, just by framing our positionality, right, who we are, our perspectives related to this very important topic. And so I'll ask um, each of us really to open by sharing how it is that we are framing our understanding of resistance, right, versus resilience and relative to resilience, and to describe how it is that we use, you know, or have utilized a resistance framework in our own work. So I'm hoping, given that you've heard me talk for some time, that we can begin with uh, Dr. Pierce and Mary Kelly, and then move on to um, Dr. Adames, and I will certainly add to the opening remarks. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's such an honor, and I truly humbled to be here with my co-panelists. Um, thank you, Dr. Jernigan Nuesi, for inviting me, and Dr. Adamas for your fellowship, um, Professor Goodman for hosting us. Um, this is just a wonderful opportunity, and I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, I first encountered the concept of resilience through Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, um, the founder of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco and the first Surgeon General of California. Um, I had invited her to speak at a law firm where I then worked as part of a series on poverty and equity that I was organizing with the United Way, and it was July of 2015. Um, as she talked about average childhood experiences and the biology of toxic stress, I just felt a light bulb go off in my head and I knew this was going to change my life. Um, what she was saying made so much sense to me and explained so many things about my own life experience and things that I had um, observed in my practice. You may have heard about average childhood experiences or ACEs and their connection to toxic stress and the damage they can do to physical, mental, and emotional health. ACEs are a set of 10 adversities experienced by people before they're 18. They're what I call within the four walls adversities, like living with someone who has a substance abuse illness or a mental illness, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and others. Researchers have found that on a population level, there is a dose response relationship between the number of ACEs as a rough proxy for toxic stressors and a large number of health problems, including the leading causes of illness and death in the United States, um, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, suicide. Retrospectively, the more ACEs, the higher the risk of illness. Knowledge is power, Dr. Burke Harris said. If we know this, we can change this for today's babies and children and tomorrow's adults. I was hooked. Um, soon enough, um, I had joined her board, um, opened my own law office, and that, that office exists with the purpose of using my legal skills to advance public and judicial understanding of toxic stress and its impact on children. Um, CYW had a motto when I joined, health begins with hope. Um, we believed that a greater understanding of adversity coupled with a secure relationship with at least one responsive and supportive adult could help children live healthier lives. And the term we used for the ability to buffer the impact of adversity was resilience. We recognized it as the product of families, medical teams, and communities working together. While the term resilience is also used to describe systems, communities, and the environment, I usually associate it with this ability to withstand or recover from potentially toxic stressors. And that is how I encountered the concept of resilience as a medicalized term that was linked to the science of early adversity and buffering or recovery experienced mostly within the family. Um, the science of ACEs and toxic stress has been a continued focus of my work in translational research and appellate advocacy. And I've come to see early adversity and child toxic stress as a key driver of inequality and human suffering. Relevant to today's panel though, I've also come to understand over time that the concept and recommendation of resilience can also be very damaging. And I'd like to turn to that next in the context of framing resistance versus resilience. For me, starting to frame resistance versus resilience means looking for what was absent in the ACEs and resilience concepts as I originally used them and as I originally learned them. The original ACEs study was performed in the 1990s on a cohort of people insured through Kaiser Permanente in California, mostly middle-aged white people, middle income, some college education. It measured within the four walls adversities. So what was missing? I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? All the other American demographics, both race and class-based, all the adversities that befall children outside their homes. Related to these gaps, I have a short story from Philadelphia. So in the early 2010s, the Philadelphia ACEs Task Force began studying adversities in Philadelphia, a far more diverse and less wealthy cohort than the original ACEs study. The researchers also added a number of what they called urban ACEs, including poverty, racism, discrimination, community violence, and others. One of their findings was that there were a significant number of people in the cohort, 11%. I'm not a scientist but I think that's significant, 11%, um, who did not have any traditional ACEs exposures at all, but did have urban ACEs exposures. And they'd experienced ACEs, all of them, at a higher level, much higher than the people in the initial study. In that context, the concept of resilience clearly made less sense. What does it mean to counsel resilience in response to racism, discrimination, and poverty? What does it mean to tell families living in food deserts and facing daily microaggressions that sleep hygiene, exercise in nature, and a healthy diet can help mitigate toxic stress? In urban schools with metal detectors, school resource law enforcement officers, and zero tolerance discipline strategies, what are we offering when we talk about the value of restorative justice? Could it be that we're speaking to the wrong audience and delivering the wrong message. 
In a 2021 article titled The Dark Side of Resilience, authors Hamdan Mariani and Michael Ungar write that resilience may be, quote, maladaptive in contexts where it masks vulnerability or prevents effective action to address risk, close quote. They note a tendency in the resilience literature to dissuade individuals from, quote, questioning context-related adversities like racism and other forms of social injustice, close quote, and instead direct them toward, quote, positive thinking and self-actualization, close quote. The problem is assigning to individuals with relatively little power over a given event or condition, like racism, the responsibility to change their own lives, praising them for, quote, overcoming odds, rather than contemplating the fundamental dysfunction of the odds themselves. Resilience as, quote, an inducement to tolerate disparity and inequality. I want to think about this a little more in the context of schooling and racial trauma, leaning on the work of my co-panelists. Dr. Jernigan Noesi, as she mentioned, has been writing about racial trauma in the lives of Black children, I think, since she probably could first hold a pencil, <laughs> and has been writing about this for many years, noting in 2010 that, quote, racial stress can emerge when systems are oblivious or unwilling to acknowledge the presence of racism and its negative implications on the development of Black children and adolescents who are forced to find ways to cope with the ongoing physiological stress. Psychological. I put in physiological, that was my cheat. Dr. Jernigan Noesi explains that these stressors result in both physical and psychiatric distress in a social context that frequently and nevertheless declares racism a relic of the past. In that article, Racial Trauma in the Lives of Black Children and Adolescents, she observes the value in empowering children to resist by acknowledging and validating their experiences in opposition to the gaslighting they frequently experience. Dr. Jernigan Noesi suggests a strengths-based approach to assessing and treating racial trauma in children, pointing out that trauma, this trauma is the deliberate targeting of persons of color because of their racial background. For these children, identity development is essential to their ability to survive and thrive in racially oppressive environments. I wanna put a pin in that for a little bit later when we talk about Florida. Dr. Adamus and colleagues focused on exploring a collective rather than individual framework for people of color and indigenous individuals to process and heal racial trauma. Their approach is critically important at a time when toxic individuality has taken over so much of the public sphere. Where much of resilience literature puts the onus on the individual to understand and heal trauma, the focus of their 2020 article titled Toward a Psychological Framework of Radical Healing in Communities of Color is resistance with applications to clinical practice, research, training, and social justice advocacy. So in framing resistance versus resilience, at this point in my thinking, and I'm a novice relative to my co-panelists, resilience is simply the context, the, simply the wrong context within which to think about racial trauma. And I'll now turn to a specific application of resistance within a public education context. And this part of the story starts in the fall of 2020. Um, I'm sure some folks will remember when former President Trump issued Executive Order 13950, which prohibited training based on, quote, race or sex stereotyping or, quote, scapegoating. And essentially, that order purported to enforce an entirely colorblind view, forbidding the recognition of structural racism or sexism to all federal agencies and all contractors employed by them. The EO was soon un enjoined. I mean, it was obviously unconstitutional, but the damage did not end there. The following year, a number of states copied and pasted this executive order into their own statutes, forbidding the teaching of a broad array of concepts in public schools. To date, about 20 states have adopted state statutes, state board of education resolutions, legislative resolutions, and state attorney general opinions, prohibiting the teaching of a long list of so-called divisive concepts. Further, a number of states have adopted parental rights statutes that place heavy burdens on teachers to publish every piece of instructional material they use in class, forming a great big target. Florida intends to institute rules going after the licenses of teachers who, for example, teach that the United States is not colorblind. Let's focus in a bit closer on Florida's divisive concept statutes. So um, there's been you know, a terrible time for teachers in Florida and everywhere due to the pandemic coming at the end or right, I guess right in the middle of the pandemic, they have this ambiguous, hard to interpret statute with very hard penalties. Likely as a result, Florida faces a near catastrophic teacher shortage. And further, these laws and impacts are leading Florida in a direction that will likely harm all students as a result of the Florida government's attempt to constrain the teaching and learning of a range of concepts that benefit all students and the historically marginalized most of all. <laughs> 
I'll briefly explain by sharing a couple of aspects of Florida's most recent request for pro, um, proposal for social studies textbooks and put on your seatbelts for this one. So Florida's specification for K through 12 required instruction planning and reporting states that critical race theory, social justice, culturally responsive teaching, social and emotional learning, and any other unsolicited theories that may lead to student indoctrination are prohibited, close quote. The specifications for what is thereby prohibited include the concept that people, quote, cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race, color, sex, or national origin, close quote. On its face, this prohibition appears wholly American. It looks like a prohibition on discrimination, and it is not. It functionally requires teachers to tell students that the Constitution and our civil society are colorblind, which is patently false. And my co-panelists can talk a lot more about how damaging that is. Further, the specifications state that culturally responsive teaching is not in alignment with the statute. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even know what to do with that. Perhaps most damaging, the document declares that social and emotional learning materials are, quote, considered extraneous unsolicited strategies prohibited in the specifications for the texts and are not part of subject area standards. Prohibited concepts and areas of instruction include identity, identity identification concepts, managing emotion, developing relationships, and social awareness. So SEL, I mean, I'm, I know I'm in a college of education, I'm really talking out of school here, but SEL and emotional learning, you know, culturally responsive teaching, that benefits all students, racially marginalized students, most of all in many ways. And in fact, racial identity development and culturally responsive teaching are key recommendations in the California Surgeon General's report on primary prevention of toxic stress. Beyond toxic stress, SEL and culturally responsive teaching boost literacy rates. This is important because everywhere in America, we have a literacy crisis. Let's have a look at Florida, where 46% of white fourth graders are proficient readers, 34% of Hispanic, and 23% of Black fourth grade students are proficient. What does that mean for our future? While racially marginalized students who form a majority, a very big majority in Florida public schools are not being well served by the Florida schools, the only demographic that's majority literacy proficient is Asian American students. So why are cultural conservatives in Florida and many other states focusing on patriotic education and colorblindness instead of the literacy skills that would advance their states in every way? Why indeed? So to counsel resilience to individuals facing this educational catastrophe would be foolhardy. There is no way to adapt to this and certainly no way for individual students to react in a functional way. The only sane response is to resist and reconstruct. Thank you. Thank you um, for starting us off, certainly in terms of our discussion and putting so much you know, on our virtual table, so to speak, for us to consider and to continue to discuss. Um, during the time that we have this evening and, and ideally beyond. Um, there are several things that I was writing down um, and want to come back to um, uh, following our opening remarks, but I will also um, invite and also thank you, um, Mary Kelly, for offering a tangible example that we can also um, kind of come back to in the, the remaining portions of our discussion. But I'll invite Dr. Adames to offer some opening remarks as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Jernigan OSC, and it's really an honor to be here in community with both you and Dr. Persine, and um, thank you, Dr. Goodman, for the invitation. So good evening, everyone. My name is Hector Adamas. I'm a queer African, uh, a, a queer Afro-Dominican cis male. I'm in my early 40s. I'm wearing a black beanie hat, a black shirt, and I use the pronouns of he, him, and they. Um, as I was preparing to think about and thinking about what I wanted to share with you all tonight, um, I wanted to start off with language. And I know Dr. Jernigan Oessi um, briefly mentioned the importance of language earlier on in the, in the top of the hour. For us in psychology, and just as people, we use language in so many ways. We use language to make sense of our own existence, we use language to make sense our, of our internal subjectivities, and we use language to make sense of the outside world. We also need and use language to build community and to share with others um, about us and who we are. So undoubtedly, words shape our existence, words shape us. And in many ways, language is clearly powerful. So 
I want us to think that if and when we are valuing and deeply committed, um, committing ourselves to human rights, to social justice, to racial justice, it is evident in the language we use in everything that we do. So language, in essence, can liberate us. Um, it could connect us. It could connect us to others. But language also can be limiting. And language can also limit us since it's often bound by politics, bound by context, and bound by different ways of knowing or what we call in, in academia epistemology. So from this frame around the language that we have been socialized to use, both within the community where we grew up, the family that we grew up and the profession that we chose, um, I really think it's important for us to um, center and interrogate language from time to time, if not always. So this framing around language guides my thinking around the concept of resilience and resistance. So because at the end of the day, I am a professor, I want to share some quick facts about the word of resilience. And I've always been a curious person. Um, my mother told me she doesn't understand where, she, where I got all this curiosity. And then I look at her and I said, I got it from you, mom. Anyway, so um, a couple of fun facts. I'm curious about when did folks started using the concept of resilience and, and resilient? So scholars have traced the word all the way back to Greek writers. So from Seneca, um, the elder to, to Cicero. And of course, um, at least here in the United States, everything starts in Greece. Um, interesting for us to kind of keep in mind. Um, then again, in the 1600s, specifically in 1625, Francis Bacon um, is often credited for using the term in, in the sciences. And then in the 1800s, um, the, the concept of resilience and resistance, um, uh, resilience, excuse me, was um, connected to disaster recovery. And then in psychology, my field, um, the concept of resilience and resilient um, took root around the 1970s. And it really, um, Holland is the one who's given credit for this. So it's important to kind of think about what was also going on um, in the world and here in the United States around the 70s. So when I looked at all these bodies of work throughout the decades, throughout the centuries actually, um, what I've noticed is that the linchpin that connects and holds resilience in place today in the 21st century in 2022, is that resilience is typically used to describe um, how people are courageous, how people have strength in the face of adversity, okay? But there's another piece that actually caught my attention is that resilience is really thought of that people need to then behave in a socially expected and, 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 and to have a, a specific desirable outcome. And if the individual is coloring outside those lines, typically we don't say that they're being resilient. We tend to demonize them, marginalize them and so forth and so on. I really like the work of um, Alison Howell and um, Jijian Baranka from the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, um, who do a really nice job at outlining many of the existing models of resilience that are used today. Um, and I like that they describe these models as, quote, technologies of looking inward, technologies of looking inward. And when I started kind of thinking about, wow, technologies of looking inward, it kind of made sense to me, it clicked, right? Because a lot of these models of resilience are really encouraging and celebrating and uplifting the importance of positive thinking, the importance of, in psychology, CBT, we need to just change our thoughts. And if you change our thoughts, it'll impact how we behave and it'll impact what we do, right? So there's this hyper-focus on neoliberal individualistic principles, such as passive hope, empowerment, that's something that's done to us, to the person, self-determination, that you're gonna get to a destination, to your goal by yourself. And of course, I have to say the uh, emphasis and of grit, right? So all of these different stances really glorify um, and celebrate resilience. 
right? It, it, it really celebrates how people are able to bounce back, how people become stronger in the broken places. And I really get that from one of my mentors, Dr. White, who always talks about the importance of um, um, becoming stronger in the broken places. And in many ways, when we really think about the message behind resilience, we're really using a recovery model, right? We're really, we're really using a recovery model of something happened, something was broken, something was damaged. The person has courage and strength to put the pieces back together, okay? And then we celebrate that entire process if, if, they are connected to a socially desirable, if they're behaving in a socially desirable way. So what happens if we are truly going to speak the unspoken? If we're really gonna try to speak the unspoken, which I know it's the goal of our panel tonight, is that we need, or I welcome us to consider the question of, what are we recovering from? What are we recovering from? And more specifically, what are Black, Indigenous, and other people of color recovering from? And it is here that a lot of my work centers on this one question, right? Um, I work in community with other scholar activists, and we work in exploring and understanding this question and um, this question of what is breaking our people Right? Why do we constantly have to be bouncing back? And of course, when, if we're gonna be honest, it's because we live and we exist in a white supremacy culture, right? Um, that dictates our lives, that um, this is the way, so, uh, at least in the United States and honestly across the world, um, the social order. And that creates a lot of oppression, including racism. So how policies and how laws, right? how they are grounded in ethnic and racial hate, they cause, they maintain, and they exacerbate what I like to call racism-related stress and trauma. And it's really important for us to kind of think about that. And that is what we are celebrating. That is what we are uplifting, right? Um, that is what we are applauding people bouncing back and surviving all of that hate. So if we're going to practice resistance in psychology, and I'm speaking from my point of view and of my field, it requires us to understand people not only from the inside out, which is the dominant frame that we use to understand people. And for those of you who are into philosophy, what is known as the Cartesian philosophy, that's important and we need to do that, but we also need to understand people from the outside in. And that's really where the field is lacking. Um, although of course, in most recent years, um, there seems to be a lot of energy around understanding people and communities from the outside in. And the group that I work with um, are part of the folks who are trying to do this work. Right, and we write a lot about how resistance can actually be a source of healing. Um, and we think about resistance as a form of healing um, by it being grounded in liberation psychology, by it being grounded in um, intersectionality theory, right, and other theories that have been developed by and for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And real quick, I'll give you some kind of um, crystallized points in terms of how I think and how the group that I work with, how we think about um, uh, resistance as a form of healing. We become, we focus on um, active resistance, right? We're very deliberate in, in, in centering and honoring um, active resistance rather than solely reactionary resilience, because we see re resilience as reactionary to something, to being broken, right? So people of color, um, we help them view that oppression, that their oppression is a collective assault, that it's not just about self-determination, right? It's a collective assault. And if it's a collective assault, it requires a unified response as well. As clinician, um, thinking about resistance as a form of healing, then we're able to conceptualize or understand people's problem and intervention within a social historical context. 
So we need to kind of um, break the, 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 the break out of our professional gated communities and really think about how other disciplines could provide us with some information about human behavior, mental processes, and humanity. If we're conceptualizing and thinking of people within a social historical context, then undoubtedly we are centering power. And I like to use um, Noble's definition of power, that power is the ability to define reality and make other people respond to that reality as if it was their own. And in some ways, a lot of us use and subscribe to resilience without questioning who created resilience, why is it hyper-centered and so forth and so on. So power is really important. Four other points. That treatment, the goal of treatment is to promote not only self-determination, but collective determination, okay? Not only self-determination, but also collective um, determination. And that if we help people develop a relationship with resistance, they're able to stop blaming themselves for the oppression, for the, the racism that they experience. I don't know about you, but to me, this is what healing looks like. So we help people resist making um, um, the individual person the locus of change, okay? Or only the locus of change. That change also needs to happen systemically, institutionally, not just inside the individual, again, from the outside in. And then we need to expand and reimagine healing and wellness, not just the ways in which we have been um, socialized. Um, a lot of this work, again, I don't do it alone. I do it with my wonderful colleagues and communities. So some examples, um, Dr. Nayeli Chavez Duenas, we've developed several healing approaches, including the HEART framework, which stands for healing after racial trauma. Also with um, the Psychology of Radical Healing, which is a group of psychologists of color, we developed the Psychology of Radical Healing. Um, we also developed a recent um, therapeutic approach that we named Keeping Radical Healing in Mind, um, the therapeutic approach that was published earlier this year. And members of this group, group includes Dr. Neville, Dr. Travis Duenas, um, Mosley, Lewis, French, and Chen. So in closing, I believe that we need to be more interdisciplinary again, and this is what excites me about this panel tonight. So thank you, Miriam, for putting this together. And that this also includes bringing into the conversation, right, or expanding who we're bringing in to also include artists, to include community activists, to include the folks who are actually doing this work much better than any of us um, in this panel. And in that spirit, I really want to center the words of an artist, of Juno Diaz, who's also like myself, an Afro-Dominican artist. He was also a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he eloquent, at least for me, captures the theme of our panel today. And he says that people of color are the only superpower this country will ever know. We survived everything this world threw at us. We survived war, we survived dictators. We survived torture and violence and endless violence and borders, all the damn freaking borders and the loneliness of the newcomers in the new land. And we survived the ingratitude of the nation where we settled, the nation we helped build for whom we continuously die. And we survived the infinite heartbreak that is the true story of immigration and the true story of people of color. And we survived the agony of not knowing how to bear witness to that history and to ourselves. We survived the hate, the hate that never seems to die, the hate that pretends to be patriotism, that pretends to be security, that pretends to be leadership, a hate that won't listen to reason, to morality, to compassion. We survived it all. We are among the greatest heroes and sheroes and theyros our world has known. And yet, despite all we do and all we are, we find ourselves attacked and demonized. And this is why we cannot just survive. It cannot just be about resilience or living. We have to fight. We have to resist. We have to fight for justice. We have to fight for equality and equity 
All of us must be free. All of us must be free. All of us must be free or none. Thank you. Taking a deep breath. All right, let that um, really settle and sink in. Thank you, Dr. Adamas, for the gift of history um, in terms of sort of grounding us and locating us um, from an educational perspective, thinking about the origins of resilience, um, challenging us to think about the ways in which we have utilized and conceptualized resilience and imposed the concept of resilience um, on individuals and communities, um, and for leaving us the very sort of in the opening remarks, <laughs> setting us up, right, with a very powerful quote from Juno Diaz. Um, I will just add briefly to the, the, the comments and then shift us into um, some shared questions that we can um, begin to um, discuss amongst ourselves. But if I, if I take a step back and again, um, build upon my opening remarks and think about my earliest introduction, um, and I was taking notes, right, uh, while both of you were talking in terms of places and resources that I want to go back to. Oh, what it would have been for me to have had you, Dr. Adamas, um, as a young psychology student, as a professor, um, because I think much of what I was experiencing and much of what I described, right, even um, in, as an undergraduate psychology major, um, being introduced to the concept of resilience didn't sit well, and I didn't necessarily have, right? I had some, I think, resources and references and powerful, you know, sort of mentors, but wasn't validated in the field of psychology, right? Sort of my observations, my critique, my perspective. Um, so there were so many points that were shared that resonate with me. And as I sort of go back and locate myself, right, as a psychologist um, in the sort of the fields of psychology and development, which were really central, right, to my training as both a psychologist and a psychologist focused on um, children, uh, the concept of resilience, as you noted, um, Dr. As Dr. Adamas noted, you know, really being described as this ability of individuals, right, to overcome, right, to, to somehow surpass, right, potential barriers, right, to their development, to their well-being when faced with adversity. And even in some of those um, definitions, as you noted, um, thinking about misfortune, right, as being a part. So this idea of misfortune or adversity. That was initially for me, right, uh, uh, problematic because my first questions were regarding what's being discussed and conceptualized as, adver as adversity, right? What are we recognizing as adverse experiences and who's included, right, and, uh, versus excluded? And I think it's important to note, which was mentioned, that we are having this conversation right tonight in, in 2022, but certainly as a psychologist, as a mental health provider, as a social scientist, we um, have to recognize that um, fields of mental health in particular um, have not really historically, historically and arguably currently really acknowledge right, uh, racism right, um, as adversity. I think there's been, as you noted, or as the panels have noted, some movement that's relative movement in terms of recognizing right, sort of race racism um, as being um, uh, 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 certainly important and very significant um, experiences for folks of color. But in January, as I've often said in some of my trainings, in January of 2020, um, 2020, excuse me, there were very different conversations. I was having very different conversations as someone who's a proponent of also sort of understanding and recognizing racism related stress and trauma. So I think um, as we, or what, whatever our disciplines may be, or even as, right, sort of individuals in relation to others, challenging that idea um, and the definitions, I, I challenge us all, if you haven't, to just Google resilience, look at the visuals, look at the definitions. And for me, just the passive nature, right, the individualized nature were things that, again, didn't align with the folks that I was interacting with, didn't necessarily represent my, my experiences or, or certainly perspectives as a person of color um, in the context of the United States. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to also recognize that uh, the disregard, quite frankly, uh, of experiences of racism as significant and harmful, right, in terms of their impact to folks of color has been, if I'm being like sort of really direct, right? Sort of ignored, minimized, dismissed, continues to be so, as I said, in certain contexts for decades because we have had scholars, right? We have had activists. We've certainly had practitioners, supporters who have said for decades, right? Um, or championed the notion of that recognition. 
in addition for me, I think definitions of resilience um, in some ways, again, as I sort of think about my own trajectory professionally, while they may have attempted to evolve, so you may sort of see um, the written scholarship or read the written scholarship or hear some of the scholarship where there was this nod to the importance of integrating culture, I'm putting in air quotes and context in air quotes, right, sort of loosely defined as being important in terms of how we're understanding resilience, how that was operationalized and actualized um, continues to remain a question. Those recognitions, in other words, were very limited. So as a mental health provider working with uh, mostly individuals of color across the lifespan, it, it made me, um, or sort of led me, continue to pose questions with regard to how we're applying this concept of misfortune, right, and adversity and resilience to people of color. There was a way in which resilience, right, um, is discussed and defined in this very subjective manner, which I think Dr. Adama so articulately laid out for us, right, that sort of speaks to um, this idea that an individual, right, or a group of individuals subjectively define the sort of notion of success or what it means to surpass or to bounce back right, based on a certain set of standards and expectations. So I appreciate the framing in terms of, you know, sort of thinking about society, right, and the sort of idea um, of how that becomes defined. But that also, right, sort of further led me to question who, right, gets to determine, bit of a rhetorical question um, at this point, but who gets to determine, right, someone's alleged resilience and under what circumstances, right, or which circumstances represent this the sort of the idea of misfortune as passive. Um, by way of example, as a person who works very closely, has certainly as a behavioral health provider, worked uh, closely with youth and families, but even um, to date, right, as a consultant that works with school districts and schools and youth and family serving organizations, I, the vi I'm a very visual person. So the visual that often comes to mind to me when I worked in schools or attended celebrations or graduations was the sort of propping up of youth of color at graduation ceremonies and Really, I would say asking, but in some ways, um, I don't know that the ask, right, whether there was the ability to say no for the youth of color, but sort of that ask that they sort of stand and tell their story so that everyone watching in awe, right, could celebrate this sort of idea of their resilience and their ability. And, it, and in many academic contexts, for me, it's about the sort of idea of how academic attainment is being, um, you know, uh, defined and operationalized. But I, I can remember, you know, sort of sitting, and again, I think this still happens in those situations and, and cringing and sort of questioning um, the notion, right, about sort of deeming the resilience in the face of defined adversity or the narratives of the youth, um, many youth that were being asked and maybe in some ways forced to kind of tell their stories in, in front of large audiences of individuals. So the disturbing subtext for me in that um, is with regard to this idea of overcoming racial adversity or and and right sort of defining racial adversity or your oppression as a misfortune right as well as other right kind of um, intersectional experiences um, that uh, and frameworks that we could use to to talk about the intersections of other experiences and their influence on the lived experiences of individuals um, and I agree wholeheartedly this the, the additional subtext for me was C you can do it too right that expectation that Dr. Adam has highlighted right that by by witnessing or showing up or putting on stage um, in front of a group of individuals and naming the, the, the youth of color in many um, instances that I'm referencing as resilient, the message to other youth of color is, you know, you should be able to do this, which was highly problematic, I think for me at best. There's obvious disregard for me with regard to a couple of different factors. One, as was already stated, what are we asking people of color and communities of color to do in terms of being resilient. Instead of holding, right, the systems um, and society accountable for the factors, right, and, and um, experiences that they are facing that are directly connected to, right, um, their being. The other for me was the blatant disregard. So I can appreciate um, also the highlighting of the radical uh, healing um, collective with regard to active resistance, because that for me has always been instrumental. That, that actually was the, section of my dissertation that I hope to highlight from other scholars that I'll note as resources. But for me, there's this blatant disregard in the resilience narrative for how active of a process it is, right? For folks of color um, it, it, with regard to um, how it is that they 
engage, right, when faced with exclusion and oppression and marginalization, just to name, right, a few potential outcomes. So I always say to folks, you know, resisting racism is hard work. And by way of example, if you presume, you know, presume to interpret what you believe to be, you know, if I use myself as an example, a calm disposition, right, of me in a situation where I may be facing interpersonal racial discrimination or harassment um, or systemic oppression as resilience, you're not just ignoring the harm, right, that I'm facing in that situation, but in my humble opinion, you are disregarding right, both my sort of ancestral and intergenerational strategies that have been passed along to me, right, as mechanisms, right, um, in an effort to survive and dare we thrive, right, in the face of racial adversity and under such circumstances. So it minimizes by using passive, you know, sort of language and conceptualizations, how much it takes for Miriam, right, to sit through, you know, given exposure or situation by way of one example, there's many ways we should be thinking about um, racism, um, to sit through, right, and, and the amount of self-talk, the amount of calming right, that I may be doing in that moment, and to then celebrate, right, this sort of arbitrary or subjective definition of um, my ability, right, to remain calm is, is in many ways disrespectful um, and, and is dis disheartening and certainly disregards, again, the strengths um, of folks of color. I think now for me in 2022, I am beginning to see a trend as we sort of follow when resilience literature was introduced. Um, and, and I think this connects back to David's even opening comments, um, the sort of trend of resilience. Now that I've seen some increased, right, sort of focus on racial equity works or attention to race that we've witnessed um, in some spaces since 2020, I am also noticing, right, the, the for me, a reemergence in some ways, a, a doubling down so to speak, with regard to the suggestion that resilience is what we need to be promoting for folks of color as it specifically, right, as it pertains to racial equity and racial justice. And I encourage us, rather than continuing to label, right, the strengths and, and abilities of folks of color um, in terms of what we use to survive and thrive and resist in the midst of racially oppressive conditions as resilience, the res resistance framework for me captures the intentionality, right? Captures the deliberateness, captures the actions, right? That are enacted, that folks use to navigate and to disrupt um, on a systems and societal level, you know, those, those systems wherein that are replete with racism. So it's important, I think, for us to also think about the ways that we use language, uh, which was unpacked a little bit earlier. Um, so it doesn't perpetuate right, this framework that views the lives of people of color from a model of deficient, deficiency, inability, and pathology. The compounding effects of racial oppression requires the critical consciousness that is um, uh, outlined um, in uh, both the 2020 article by the Rad Radical Healing Collective and the most recent for those folks in the field of mental health. And I think even if you're not, very powerful, I think, tools and resources to ground yourselves in um, and to expand your learning. Uh, we don't want, I don't want um, us to continue to negate, right, and recognize the strengths of folks of color that have existed, as Juno Diaz so powerfully put in his quote, so I won't belabor this point, right, existed historically and currently, um, and that facilitate their ability to exist and to define, right, uh, themselves collectively um, outside of solely, right, experiences of racialization and racial minoritization. So said another way, Right, race absolutely is a central factor. Racial justice is a critical um, uh, point um, and as well as uh, certainly goal that we should constantly be working toward, but it's not the sole experience that defines the existence of folks of color. We can and do define ourselves and our experiences that exist outside of our juxtaposition to whiteness. So resilience is, um, for me, has historically not always been, you know, operationally um, defined. I think that for the panel, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, we we certainly aren't arguing uh, the throwing away, right, of the, the concept and the conceptualization. And so we'll talk a little bit about when resilience frameworks can be useful or have been useful. Um, so I don't think it's a useless concept. I do think um, that it is often presented as passive. Um, and at an individualized level, which Dr. Adamas impacts for us as well. Resistance for me, as we embody and think about it, really recognizes that importance of critical awareness, um, of definition, of really looking at and analyzing situations in a very different way, um, and really help to shift the narrative and foster collective right, de definition 
um, to counter, create counter narratives for folks with regard to how it is that we're thinking about opposition, right, to power um, with regard to race. I will stop there in an effort to sort of shift in terms of just um, allowing folks to hear a little bit about how we are individually and across our opening remarks collectively thinking about resistance and want to turn um, to you know, some of the questions that, and I think in our preparation, um, we designed to kind of engage in other aspects of the, the conversation. As folks are listening, please again, feel free to ask questions or to um, make comments in the, in the chat box that we will ideally engage in about 15 minutes or so. We do wanna leave time for that before we end. But I'd like to put uh, pose a question, I think um, Dr. Adamas just to follow up and then certainly invite uh, both Mary, uh, uh, Mary Kelly and myself to chime in as well. As you think about the consequences, I think you already started to outline this of using a, sort of a solely resilience framework, especially when we're thinking about the impact of racism related stress and trauma. What do you feel are the consequences, right? Of sort of solely utilizing this framework? What are we missing, right? Um, from your perspective, as you think about, especially kind of healing. Yeah, yeah, so like the consequences. Yeah, um, it's a very good question. I think what's missing is so much. I mean, I mean, you outlined everything that's missing um, from folks of color when we're only focusing on how they are or are not being resilient. Um, I think we're missing the opportunity to name where the problem is or where the problem is originating from, right? And instead, what we end up doing is blaming people for their oppression, blaming people for the ways in which they're being dehumanized. Um, the isms, all the different forms of oppression, um, it, it, we're, we're centering it inside the individual, inside the family, inside the community. When, um, when we really know, and I know um, Mary Kelly could talk more about this, that it's in the laws and in the policies, right? Um, and, and things like that. Um, I, I also think that what's missing is that we are also just focusing on, um, I, I think her name is Susan Cain, who's actually a JD and a writer who talks about the tyranny of positivity or in social media, they call toxic positivity, right? Um, so we really miss the opportunity to um, interrogate that stance. Um, when we're only celebrating folks' um, resilience. Um, and I think one of us, one of you two said that, you know, it puts the onus on the person that's being oppressed. Again, we're missing that opportunity to really kind of pause, think, and really understand where, um, where this is all coming from. And it really just dehumanizes folks, right? It really dehumanizes, um, de dehumanizes people. I think the other impact is that um, what we are doing in an indirect way is that we are making people who are oppressed, uh, people who are doing the oppressing, the systems that are set up to oppress in, 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 our, in our talk today, people of color, um, feel less bad, less guilty, yeah. right? We're, 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 um, getting them off the hook, as we say, right? We're not holding them responsible for their actions, for their laws and policies that they're putting in place, okay? Um, we're allowing, you know, we're justifying the behavior. And um, another piece that we're doing is that we are also um, framing the abusive and oppressive behaviors as something that leads to positive outcome. And if then we're only focusing on, on the outcome that is quote unquote positive, then why should we change the formula, right? Um, whether this is happening consciously or unconsciously, right? Um, we just wanna focus on the outcome, especially we live in a society that's so outcome driven, right? And because of that, we don't, we're losing the opportunity to really disrupt disruptive narrative. So those are some uncooked thoughts that I'm having. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I was sort of taking it in, in terms of, yeah, the, the questions also that you put, or points that you put on the table with regard to the onus. 
right, on, on individuals. I, I've, as of late, especially from an organizational perspective, been reminding folks that, you know, policies and procedures and protocols don't write themselves. People yeah. do, right? People make up systems. Um, and so in those same ways that they exist, I often hear folks, you know, talk about, well, it's really hard. This is the policy and procedure, right? Um, and again, sort of taking ownership, right? Even though there are implications from a systemic um, standpoint, um, let's move away from, I think, the tendency to, to, to reside in the overwhelm. Um, and to to not resist, right, and to sort of take action and accountability for really disrupting and dismantling, right, some of those policies and procedures and shifting, right, the onus and responsibility on those who are oppressed and marginalized to both educate and then to um, live through, right, and be deemed resilient and then, you know, um, allegedly, right, sort of work towards resolve. So thank you for that. Mary Kelly, do you have any thoughts with regard to sort of the consequences or the impact, um, especially I think given your opening remarks as you talked about your introduction to resilience and kind of where you are now. Yeah, then, and then I have a, a question at the end for both of you, but I mean, I, I come at this um, as a white person, as a, as a parent, um, as a lawyer, um, way back when as a, as a literature professor. So just to kind of situate the way that I think about this, um, I think that that the major tragedy of what we're seeing in so many of these states and the way that it is kind of draining the meaning out of the curriculum, draining the meaning out of what is American history, what is American literature, the, the first tragedy is, of course, the marginalized children who are completely not served and are victimized further by those laws and policies. There is also a sense in which I go back to the Heather McGee, um, the some of us um, analogy, that key analogy of when desegregation became the law, or at least putatively became the law, became the formal law, what happened with community pools, and this is the central metaphor of the book, what happened with those with the community pools is that white people drained them and filled them with cement so that they would not have to share the pools with people who would then be required admission. So who lost? I mean, everyone did. We know who lost the most. And so from an ethical perspective, from a moral perspective, we have to think first about historically marginalized, historically oppressed children and their racial identity, their development. How What was that experience like for them and what was the outcome for them? And we also think about what my kids would have been in that position. They would have lost out as well. I think that we're looking at a kind of draining out, I think I used the word drain in the pool, right? But drain also drain the meaning out of the way that we experience our national community. Um, we are so fractured now, so individualized, the way that children are presented in this kind of legal um, regime is as each one, just an isolated individual kind of spinning in this universe of school, unconnected to family, community, history, each other, we do not have a sense of being interdependent as communities of people. And so um, I'm not sure whether I'm actually answering the question, but I think, you know, when I was looking, when I, when I first experienced resilience, it was a very different way of thinking about the ways that individuals relate to each other and knit together into a community. So I've learned a lot, but as I said previously, um, here with the two of you, I'm really the, the novice in the room in that regard. Um, I could say more about the law and policy, but what I really wanted to ask the two of you was when you think about, because from an outsider's perspective, I view psychology as a discipline that treats the individual. So when you're thinking about this question of toxic individuality and the way that we see that reflected more and more and more in our laws and policies and in the way that our society fails its children, how do you think of disciplinarily about moving from the individual toward the collective? I would, and I'll invite um, Hector for you to chime in. So I think you noted something earlier. So, so even as a psychologist, right, I fully recognize that my training in psychology is presented from a particular right uh, perspective in terms of what is deemed appropriate, right, for me to have, you know, sort of content expertise, et cetera. Um, so what I'm hoping to highlight is I think that there absolutely is a perspective and a, you know, often um, noted as a westernized view of psych psychological practice that is very individualized. There have always been, um, again, other scholars and folks that are less often right, in, um, integrated into maybe the formalized training of psychology in the United States, um, et cetera, that don't operate from such an individualized perspective. For me, if I sort of look again, um, and I attended, so positionality, I attended historically black college and university, which had a very different core curriculum, right, for um, 
or uh, for folks um, that may not be, you know, historically black colleges and universities um, often have core curriculum that are sort of rooted in racial cultural experiences. And so for me, that was very much the case of my psychological curriculum. I had psychology 101. I also had, you know, sort of courses on black psychology, for example. Um, and so I at least had the benefit and even decades later, right, when I'm training and working with trainees, recognize that much of what I learned at an undergraduate level because of that unique experience isn't present in psychological training. So I think first, there are many of us that certainly recognize that westernized psych psychology can be very individualized, but, but also know that there are other, right, sort of approaches and ways and, and mechanisms of sort of thinking about healing and actually do integrate those. They're just often not cited, recognized. I think when when they become trendy, right, or, or there are some folks that may co-opt um, uh, some of those perspectives, and we've seen some of that, I think, even more recently, um, but that that's where I would sort of uh, start in terms of, like, my thinking recognizes traditional westernized psychology, but I have always operated from and used a very different lens um, as a person of color that is more collective, and I think part of my starting my opening comments and going back to those in terms of just that almost, you know, sort of seeming confusion, right? Where I'm sort of learning and mandated to learn traditional westernized psychology in terms of my degrees and graduate degrees, but it didn't align with, right? The experiences, my experience, but certainly the experience of communities of color um, um, and individuals of color that I was working with. So I think that's an important recognition is what are we not? Um, and I put we in air quotes again, sort of acknowledging in terms of the work um, and the ideology and the perspectives and the conceptual frameworks of folks that haven't, that don't show up in those traditional psychological textbooks. Hector, I don't, if you want to, to add. Yeah, that. I mean, I would say diddle, 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 right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so it's a great question that you're asking, Mary Kelly, but, you know, my thinking is which psychology? And I think when we talk about psychology, the default is that we're talking about, um, Mary, Miriam is calling it Western psychology, I'm calling it white psychology, right? Um, that, you know, those are, those are the men that I read, that I was exposed to, right? The classics and, and, and even the contemporary ones. And a lot of those theories just, I'm like, what is this? It just doesn't resonate with the way my parents, my community, um, think about the world, think about people, think about humanity, think about existence. So because I was um, raised by a very strong Black woman, um, I had the freedom to, to, to question, right? And to, um, I was celebrated uh, to question and to ask a lot, of, a, a lot of questions. So I took that with me whether I was aware of it or not. And I was questioning everything that I was reading. I was like, yeah, this just doesn't really sit well. It just, I hear it, I get it, I'll study it. I pass my, all my exams fine, <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, so it was not, which is really sad. It was not till my late graduate um, doctoral training or even during my early, early career years that then I was really had the time and the freedom and um, to kind of think and read um, scholars of color that I was not exposed to. And then I, then I really see that this dichotomy that psychology is only interested in what's going on between our ears was a fallacy, right? And then that reminds me like, wow, everything that white supremacy touches, it destroys, including the knowledge of black, brown and other psychologists of color. Um, and that has been a saving gr grace for me. That's why um, I fell in love. That's when I fell in love with the field. Mm -hmm. I think before that I was in puppy love, I was in a not so healthy romance, but I fell in love with the field once I started reading about how people that look like me theorize and talk about the people that I come from. Um, so today I train my students to not think of psychology um, only focusing on the individual because yes, we need to focus on the individual, that's important. And I think that's very unique about our field, but also we need to underscore that people do not develop in a vacuum, that we develop in a context. Right, And how do we help people be bilingual, multilingual, and being able to swim, again, with what, uh, with what I said earlier, understanding people from the inside out and the outside in. And that's a form of resistance. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So not sure, Mary Kelly, if that helped or answered a piece of your question. No, it really did. I really appreciate that. Um, I think that one of the, you know, another one of the tragedies that we've seen um, in what's going on with these um, divisive concept statutes is that they are doing an excellent job of making sure that kids who look like my kids um, and people like me actually do not have to be resilient in some key ways, right? They, if you look at the, the text of the statutes, they are protecting white people from feeling bad, right? You can't teach concepts and structures and facts that will make people uncomfortable on account of their race. I mean, we all know what that means. Um, and I think, you know, that that is, um, it's incredibly destructive. And I think that, you know, in terms of resisting, if we're thinking about a, a structure of resistance in that context, um, I don't think that we're well served if we don't just call it out for what it is. I mean, it's racial animus and that's unconstitutional and it's cruel and it's unethical. I'm curious, uh, Mary Kelly, if you can kind of build upon that a little bit um, and we'll certainly check in with David to see if there are other questions. And and you've certainly talked about some of the work that you've done, especially you know with regard to the law. But as you think about working towards racial justice, how are you applying, right? You're sort of... Um, understanding of resistance and challenging even, you know, sort of your colleagues in the profession of law, right, to think about resistance um, as, you know, working towards racial justice? Um, I think that, um, and that's an excellent question, um, because it does sometimes feel um, so overwhelming to be educated and sort of practicing within um, a framework that can feel very um, concrete, um, very immovable. Um, I think for me, um, part of the, the work that um, I've really tried to increase is talking to people about children and the impact on them of toxic stress in the sense of racial trauma, discrimination, identity formation, that, um, you know, I think, you know, what we tried to do with the DACA case was really show the justices that that children's well-being and the harm done to children by losing their parents has to be weighed into the equities of the case. It wasn't necessarily there in the black letter law, but it was incredibly important if, from a human rights equity perspective. And so we try to, uh, to shift, um, shift awareness and by shifting awareness, shift the way that the law um, reads, and I'm focusing again on children, but the way that the law reads children's well-being. As you said, I think it is extremely difficult sometimes in the law to get people to understand and credit and believe, which has to be incredibly harmful, that people actually do experience racism. I can't imagine what it's like to be a person who experiences racism and to be told that you're making it up. And yet that's what we do to our fellow citizens. And so that's something that we've got to call out in the law as well. I don't know, um, Hector, if you have any, just as you think about just even your own work, which again, you started to highlight, but just that idea of actively, right, applying concepts. I hear it, you know, as you talk about the, your, how it is that you teach, right, and educate the next generation of mental health providers um, in terms of their framing and introduction of, you know, content, right, and perspectives that may not have been present in your earlier, you know, sort of graduate training years, but anything that you might, uh, that you want to add in terms of this idea of applying, right, the framework of resistance um, with regard to your work, but also towards, you know, thinking about racial equity and racial justice. Yeah, in terms of applying, I mean, you know, um, I think before we get into action and doing work, we really need to be honest with ourselves and ask, what am I willing to give up? What am I willing to lose? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is nothing, then there is no action. There's nothing that we could apply, right? So within itself, this is it's it's a maybe a first step of action to kind of think about: Am I really willing to put myself on the line for um, racial justice, for human rights, right? And um, what are my, you know, yeah. So so that's that's something to really keep in mind. And if I'm being completely honest, I think that's something that most of us will struggle with. Right, um, regardless of where we come from, um, but specifically, I would I love to always ask white people, um, what are you willing to give up in order to really, um, you know, put action to 
the words that 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 you're that you are saying are you really to openly challenge oppression when it's noticed when are you willing to engage in civil disobedience whether that is you know more traditional forms of civil disobedience or civil disobedience within your respective profession right when are you willing to defy unjust laws uh, un unjust rules and policies right so 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 i think action starts with us really taking an inventory in terms of what am I willing to do or not? And then, um, then it's easier to come up with things that we could do, <laughs> right? But I think, I think that piece is harder, um, that I think it's important that I wanted to kind of highlight and underscore. Um, yeah, so that it's not, that we're just not passively kind of acknowledging and rejecting our own uh, oppression and, you know, challenging, um, racism and oppressive behavior only when it's professionally safe because if we look at back at folks who um and and movements that made a change in society um they did more than than those intellectual gymnastics exercises anyway so those are some thoughts that are i'm trying to shape them into action or yeah no, I think it's a, a wonderful point to highlight. Um, as of late, I think I've um, when folks, you know, engage or me, you know, as a, a racial equity consultant, I, um, that is one of the questions, right? So they may have spent the last two years, right, maybe engaging in some increased awareness and kind of knowledge. But where do we go next? What do we do? And as you were talking, it reminded me of two very powerful moments, um, both in terms of my formal training, but also you know my own kind of self-reflective work. And one was I. A, the, so the first experience for me is be, the power of having someone ask me the question that you just posed very early on. So as an undergraduate, having professors who took the time to say, what are you right, willing to get up are, or give up? What are you, right? Also, Miriam, right, sort of um, willing to do? Have you thought about the consequences? But also being in a situation um, and in a training where there was awareness that was facilitated, like a day-long retreat and folks doing things like privilege walks, et cetera, and talking about race and racial justice. And then hearing, actually one of my mentors posed the question, okay, so what are folks willing to give up? And I mean, crickets. Um, and it's, so I was both struck, right? Because I was like, wow, so this is so powerful. I remember looking around the room and looking at my colleagues in the eyes. And, and I think there was some honesty for folks to your point, Hector, which is why I want to highlight that about struggling with it. Folks were like, I don't know that I'm, I'll be specific. My white colleagues in particular, um, at least engaged in the conversation of saying, I don't know that I'm willing to give you know, things up. And I remember that being just a powerful memory, obviously. Um, and moment because it does speak to to your point the idea of awareness relative to action mm -hmm. um, and the disconnect there we do have some questions as I look at time I saw them rolling in so I'm happy that I'd like to pose and and David you can feel free to join us I can also read them um, but um, as we prepare it's 8 24 and I know that we'll run out of time but um, there are a couple of good questions that maybe we should um, yeah maybe absolutely put on in closing I mean, I'll just start by saying that um, my phone is going ballistic because I'm getting a lot of texts from people saying this is just incredible, so powerful, incredibly challenging. So thank you very much for your voices and your brilliant minds that you're bringing to this. Um, I want to make just one quick comment because I can't resist and then uh, go to one of the questions. Uh, and Hector, this I think piggybacks one of the things you were just talking about. I um, One of the things I, I tend to want to track is the ways in which the field of psychology in particular tries to sort of um, shear things of their moral import. They like to think as though they're using language such as resilience that seems as though it has nothing to do with moral or ethical imperative, right? This is sort of a scientific thing. And so it's it's cleaned and sterilized and we can all agree upon it because you know it has variables that can be measured and so forth and so on. And what strikes me is you have resilience can be used in that way, resistance cannot. Resistance is an ethical imperative. It is a, a moral stance and it has lit a fire to create change in the world and not tolerate the status quo. Um, and I think in as much as psychology continues to think what it's doing can be done without moral and ethical import, it continues to cloak and disguise the ways in which morality is being repackaged and sold to us in ways that are deeply inequitable. So I, I felt like I saw this across each of your three pieces and it just it was very powerful um, to see the, the flesh you brought to that. So 
Thank you. It's what I like to say. We're just rearranging the furniture on the sinking Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope not. I hope not. You are you are helping. I don't I don't even know how to counter matter for that. I won't try. So let's go to one of the audience questions because we want to make sure their voices are here. We probably only have time for one or two. And this one's a really hard one. Uh, can we decolonize resilience? Um, I'm going to maybe put Dr. Adamas on the spot because in our preparation, he said something that was so powerful and impactful. I don't even know if you're knowing what I'm referencing. I think, uh, uh, Hector, when you talked about the notion of resilience, you had just a very unapologetic way of sort of helping me even, right? Sort of gain some clarity and confidence and, and perspective. Do you, I don't want to misquote you. Give, give me a little your fantasy, your fantasy comments, if you're willing to share. Fantasy, gosh, I always, I'm always fantasizing. Um, <laughs> that kind of, it speaks to that, I think. Mm -hmm. Give me more. Um, keep it. It was. Really oh yes, I remember when I, I, yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say. <laughs> thank you. It's been a long. I'm long sorry. Thursday. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So when Mary Kelly, um, uh, Miriam and I, we were we've met uh, twice, um, and I was like, can I just share one of my fantasies around <laughs> around resilience? And I think this question about can resilience be decolonized? I was like. My fantasy is to tell the, when I'm in the panel, just to say, I don't need your resilience, keep it. And if from that stance, then I don't have to waste my time and energy to decolonize it. So that's one part of the fantasy. Um, the, the other part is that, unfortunately, we live in a society that, you know, uh, minoritized individuals, people of color are dehumanized, are oppressed. And at least in, in our lifetime, we have not seen otherwise. Um, and folks are strong and powerful and they find ways to put the pieces back together with other folks. And we still need to create some space to honor that and to celebrate that, but also not get fixated and get stuck at that celebration because we got work to do. So part of me wants to say, keep your resilience, stop breaking our people, and therefore we don't even have to worry about decolonizing it. And then another piece of me, it's like, well, folks are being broken. So, thanks for the reminder, Dr. Jernigan. It, it clearly resonated and, and, and stuck with me, so I thought it could be a powerful um, response there as well, and, and maybe ties into um, some of the other questions that I was looking at in terms of you know, um, in what ways, I know I mentioned this, right? Could it be useful and in what context? Um, and I think Mary Kelly, looking at the time, you actually had a, an interesting perspective. You started to mention it sort of from a societal level, societal resilience, I think was an interesting perspective for us to think about. And I think the question is, you know, if there are any ways that, right, the term resilience could be useful and in what context? So I think a lot about, I mean, as a white person, I think a lot about where white people and whiteness fits in all of this. And I think that we have, we white people have a lot of work to do in stopping the breaking, um, as Hector was saying, that is our work. Um, I think part of that is that white people need to become more resilient. We are not resilient. Right. This is what I was saying before about the laws and policies you see passing that say you can't hurt people's feelings by teaching facts. That's ridiculous. Um, I think that the, the more that we understand ourselves as a, I'm not being very articulate about this next piece, but I think that I try to teach my children constantly that we need all of us to get on the boat together. If, if we are not all free, none of us is free. Hector mentioned that as well. And that means all of us. Um, and I go back again to Heather McGee's um, book, The Sum of Us, we are greater than and greater for the sum of us. We have to go forward together, but we white people have a lot of work to do before we are capable, I think, of doing that fully. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I hate that we're at time because it feels like we, we have so much more that we could unpack here, but um, I just wanna say thank you very much for bringing your your vulnerable, powerful voices to to this topic, and and I hope we can go another round with other topics uh, before too long, because this was this was really rich and meant a lot to this community.
So thank yeah, you. If I could, um, David, just leave folks with another quote that I sort of plucked Please. out. And I see, and I do uh, respect and appreciate the questions there, but I would also encourage folks to be on the lookout. I think when David and I started the conversation and I sort of put this on the table, it was in the interest of really creating additional programming um, for folks to engage, whether that's in the form of workshops or otherwise. But I'd like to read this quote in closing and also make note of the questions we have if there are ways that we might you know, offer responses to folks that have registered. But this is a, quite, a quote by Sonia Sontag um, and at the same time, which are a part of essays and speeches that I'll challenge us to think about, right? The likelihood that your acts of resistance cannot stop the injustice does not exempt you from acting in way in what you sincerely and reflectively hold to be in the best interest of community, right? Our community, your community. Mm -hmm. So I'll just offer that in closing for folks and thank Thank you all for being here and for engaging with us. And we look forward to certainly feedback. And as you said, um, building on this discussion. And thank you, Mary Kelly and Hector <laughs> for joining me. Both of you. Thank great. you.